And welcome to At Issue. Thank you so much for joining us uh, for the next half hour. We're going to be talking about the arts in central Illinois. And not all is well with the arts. We're going to be offering up some solutions per chance. Uh, let me start by pointing out that uh, recently the Peoria Art Guild board had to let the executive director go. Uh, likewise, the ballet has lost its artistic director. Both of those were financial decisions. And we're going to be talking about those issues and solutions coming up in just a moment. But first, let me talk about Keller School. Every year, Keller School has Guest Reader Week, and uh, I was a, a, a reader. Uh, for Mrs. Popkin and uh, Mrs. Uh, Shaw's class. And I got all the signatures of all the kids that were so attentive and I really appreciate their attention. And there's a picture of um, me with uh, Fajan and Kartikeya. So Fajan and Kartikeya, there is your debut on television. And thank you to all the kids in Mrs. Shaw's and Mrs. Popkin's class at Keller School in Peoria. And with that, let me introduce four other individuals who are going to be talking about uh, the situation with arts in central Illinois. First, Bob Parkhurst is with us. Bob is the treasurer and a past president of Cornstock mm -hmm. Theater. You'll all know that as the tent theater for those of you that <laughs> <laughs> Cornstock, that, that's the it tent, is. isn't it? Rebecca Borland, who has held so many positions, I can't count them. <laughs> Let me point out that you most recently were on the Civic Center board, and there's a reason why she's, we're going to be talking about that also. So Rebecca, thank you as always for being with us. Kim Armstrong is here. Kim is the co-president along with Lindsay Ma of the uh, Peoria Art Guild board. Thank yes. you for being here. And Carl Coupler. Carl has held many, many positions, as has uh, Rebecca. Currently, he is the vice president of the Symphony Foundation. And with that, I opened up the show by saying that uh, two long-time prominent mm. arts organizations, Ballet and Art Guild, you've uh, eliminated the position of executive director and artistic director at the, at the Ballet. Financial decision. Absolutely. Oh, <clears throat> I mean, are things that tough? Things are, things are tougher than they've ever been, and, and we're not alone. I mean, obviously with the Ballet situation as well, and I think there's others that may have had a little bit deeper pockets. We don't have a great endowment. Um, so, so we had to make a decision on what were some functional areas that could be handled by the board. And we've got a great group of volunteers who are stepping up to the plate, but it is not a decision that came easy or that we really wanted to make. One of the things that I always talk about mm -hmm. when I travel is the quality of the arts in central Illinois. I always look at Peoria and compare it to other cities, and we do so well. Are we in jeopardy of losing that that extra edge? I fear for that. Um, in my opinion, the cultural arts are what really defines and identifies a community. If you go up to Chicago and go from suburb to suburb, there's really nothing but a stoplight that tells you you've moved from one town to another. But when you really remember a community, it's for its culture. It's for its history, it's for its cultural arts organizations, its public mm -hmm. art, the quality of its architecture. And we, as one of the oldest settled areas in the state, have been extraordinary for, extraordinarily fortunate that our forefathers also had and brought the cultural arts with them when they settled here. I think uh, we're in the, the worst struggle of our lives in terms of maintaining that fabric, and I'm very worried about it. Carl, the symphony has been in the headlines probably a little more often than you would like. Um, how, how tough is it? Well, it's tough. I, you know, the economy is difficult. I think some of the struggles uh, have given some people an excuse. We, we talk about season tickets and how uh, younger people don't buy season tickets the way that older folks did. You know, many people uh, bought season tickets and viewed it as a contribution, and if they only showed up half the time, they were happy to do that. Today, people aren't willing to do that, and uh, uh, people uh, have used uh, difficult economic circumstances, I think, to uh, to pull away from some of those commitments, and so it's it's made things more difficult. Uh, I think the the older organizations can survive, but they're going to have to do some things differently. Um, they're going to have to look at all of their expenses and figure out what is important. And uh, as we'll talk about soon, mm -hmm. we've all got to build new audience. I think there is a distinction between the primarily professional <coughs> arts organizations in central Illinois and the primarily volunteer arts organizations. For example, at Cornerstock Theater, we're a primarily volunteer organization, and our model is working. 
uh, we're healthy financially. Um, we have seen a, seen a drop from our very highest point in season ticket sales, but we still have strong season ticket sales. And, and our uh, success, I think, depends largely upon the quality of our product and our programming. If we have good programming that attracts people that just want to be there because they love it and are volunteering their time and talents to the organization, then we thrive and people will come see it. So uh, that's working for us. It's part, part of the issue that uh, you have too many different constituents to satisfy? I mean, well, I think, um, I, I think uh, from the visual arts perspective in this community, I mean, there's 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 several of us that exist and uh, you're you've got we've definitely got two audiences I saw it I've seen it with the fine art fair we've got the artist mm -hmm. and we've got the the public and we're trying to achieve all of us are trying to serve that mission of providing our art to the public and also supplying a venue for our artists be they visual or performing so it's not always it's not always the same um, outcome. So who's the artist? Is it a local artist or is it a professional artist? What's your, what, what are you trying to bring to the public? We're trying to educate the public on visual art, on, on great visual art, whether, and mm -hmm. we don't care where it's made. Great, great visual art though. Great visual so, art. So it isn't the role to, here's a local artist, uh, he might not be too good, but he's local, so let's promote him. No, well, it, we have standards. I mean, for the fine art fair, we have standards. For the exhibiting in our gallery, we mm -hmm. have standards. We have a committee that juries them. So it's just like auditioning for a play. You know, right. you either you either got the role or you didn't get the role. So I mean, for the fine art fair, we'll have 800, 800 artists apply for 100 spaces. So if some of those are local, that's great. But it's not really based on where they're from. Carl, likewise, with the symphony, if it were to come to a point where the symphony had to change its business, uh, f f the way it operates business-wise, might we see volunteers instead of people being paid to perform? Well, I don't know. I, you know, that would be regressing uh, a lot. As mm -hmm. Rebecca knows, I, the symphony's been here more than 100 years, and for many of those years, it was a completely volunteer mm -hmm. organization. No one was paid including Harold Plow, the conductor for the first 50 years. He, you know, he did it because he loved art and, uh, and wanted to share that. And by the way, he also sold uh, music lessons uh, <laughs> at, at night. You, you know, that's uh, one of our big solutions is that we've got to bring young people in. And, uh, you know, I think that's something that was done very effectively. Uh, in recent years, I think um, we haven't been as successful as um, maybe they were in earlier years, in doing that outreach. Even though we think about it, we talk about it, every arts organization, I mean, at the symphony, at the opera when I was involved there, all we talked about, you know, what can we do to get into the schools? What can we do to get to young people? And frankly, I've always been jealous of the ballet. You know, they, they, mm -hmm. they currently have problems, but they have this school with 230 yeah, kids every yeah. day, and their moms and dads are paying you know, that's a paying model. Again, right. that's one of those models that works. The school works. The performances are another story. One, one more issue and then we'll turn mm -hmm. to solutions. I remember 1982, the Civic Center opens. Yes. We're all looking forward to the fact that we're going to have a top-notch theater in which not only professional groups, but our local mm -hmm. groups can come. And yet, I remember headlines over time saying, Oh, the Civic Center Theater is too expensive for us. Oh, is it too expensive? How we fought and struggled for that theater. And even then, back in 1982, there was not a good business model for a performing venue. The business model that worked was for the exhibition hall and for the conference space and for the arena. But there was not a good business model for a performing arts venue. And that was one of the reasons why many, many times in the years leading up to 1982, that theater kept dropping off the table and then struggling, we pushed it back on. And that's one of the reasons it's the size it is. All of us thought back then that perhaps a little smaller venue might be more sensible, but we could not make that work on paper. We couldn't make it work. Everything, every model, every every structure we tried to put around it said you got to have 2200 seats in fact 2500 is what they recommended and at that point in time we were selling out the shrine mosque with the symphony and everybody was going we need more space we need more space now for the performing arts i know that that is a major concern of theirs that that space is too expensive but 
there isn't a way to open those doors for less than the performing arts groups pay. Even the stagehands strike a special deal with the Civic Center for the performing arts groups and they get actually paid at a different scale for our local producing groups than they do when Broadway comes in or when you know a, a, a outside person rents it. So I don't know what else can be done. I mean, it's a beautiful venue. Well, uh, uh, pardon me for interrupting, yeah, but no, G please. Gary Panetta in the Journal Star just recently suggested that maybe Five Points in Washington, mm -hmm. which has about a thousand seats, would be an alternative for, I think he suggested for the symphony, um, is that something we're looking at? Well, I, you know, I've been involved in lots of conversations. The, uh, the opera for years said if only we had a thousand seat auditorium. I think the symphony now wonders whether a thousand seat auditorium. I'm not sure and I don't, I don't begin to understand the economics of five points and y you know what tax body is subsidizing that to make it happen. Right now that's obviously a hot venue and a number of groups have gone there and uh, appear to be happy in, in trying to perform there. Um, you know, certainly our view of this metropolitan area is, is stretched enough that uh, a venue in Washington is, uh, you know, probably central to a lot of the population that is attending these events. So it's possible. I, you know, I hate to think that we have to abandon the Civic Center Theater. Uh, it's, it's a magnificent venue. It's just we've got to figure out a way um, a business to make model. the costs yeah. work, yeah. and a business and, model, and 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 a way to put shows yeah. out there that are going to appeal to these younger audiences, because eh? the the plain fact is that younger people have a, a different view. They've been educated differently, or not educated differently, <laughs> and they don't have an interest in sitting through a three-and-a-half-hour opera performance or a two-and-a-half-hour symphony performance. Okay, let's talk about solutions then. Where do we start? Well, but, I, I think every, everything's on the table. What, what can we do? To we have to know more about our audience. I think that's step one. We have to know more about what people are attracted to and what they will, in fact, invest in, uh, in terms of their own cultural development. Our community is changing. I think we would all agree with that. Uh, the types of jobs that are here are not the same types of jobs that were here when I was growing up or even when Bob was mm -hmm. growing up. I think you're the youngest of us here. Um, it, it, it's evolving and the types of people that are staying in the community versus the types that are leaving, that is changing the demographic and therefore I think the market for the kinds of things we like to do. All of us are passionate. Passion isn't enough. It's just not enough. We cannot thrive as art unless we can survive as business. So we, we have to approach it with that model in mind. I'd like to know a little bit more about the patrons and the patron base between our various organizations. I think we may be surprised at how little crossover there actually is I agree. between these arts organizations. Even among the community theaters, there's not as much crossover as you might think between Peoria Players and Cornstock, for example, or, or Cornstock and Eastlight Theater in East Peoria. So I think that might be something that, that would be interesting. You always have to be very, very careful when you're talking about patron lists because you, know, you have a fiduciary responsibility to, you know, to your patrons. But I think that is something that might, we might be able to help each other with, is analyzing our patrons a little bit and trying to figure out, is there a way we can cross-promote um, to the benefit of all of our organizations? And then facilities is another thing. Uh, Rebecca, to your point about the, the community changing, I think also we as, or, as board members have a fiduciary responsibility mm -hmm. to the organization, but we also have an obligation to our audience that perhaps what we've offered, I mean, for the Art Guilds for 148 years is not the same thing we're going to offer for the next 148 right. years. Right. And just because it's different doesn't mean it's bad. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I, we talked earlier, it is a soundbite you know, thing, and, and we're all used to the, you know, it used to be the USA Today mentality, now it's YouTube and, right. and uh, the Kennedy. iPhone. You know, if they want it quick and they want it fun. So we need to make it, it, our parents did it because they were supposed to. You're supposed to go to the symphony, you're supposed to go to the art event, you're supposed to go listen to the opera. We need to make it so it's an entertainment value, and that hopefully in that entertainment value, we do a little educating at the same time, to, so that, you know, mm -hmm. our passions are fulfilled at the same. That's my thought. Well, one of the most exciting things this fall has been the, the, the candidates coming in for the symphony music director job. Uh, every one of them 
has has spoken passionately about outreach and education mm -hmm. and going into the schools, and many of them are involved um, at orchestras around the country in uh, communities not unlike Peoria, many of them, um, but with much larger outreach programs already in place and uh, funding. Now, I will say, you know, often uh, by the state and from corporations that uh, ha have invested more in those kinds of, of, of uh, outreach and education to young people, and, and, and that's something we've got to we just have to accomplish that in in all the performing but i i, I suspect in the visual arts as well yeah. i you know that um in most of the schools uh, the artists are down at one end of the hall and right. they are not part of the mainstream mm -hmm. in those schools if, and the, if the artist exists if the art teacher exists in the school that's right right if there isn't even anyone with that job so outreach has become even more important right absolutely but there's great hope again as I thought you know as I thought about this before we came I you know again there's all kinds of uh, singing and uh, visual arts uh, you know on TV in the culture uh, on the web uh, that's part of it there's so much great art available now the opera you know we have no live opera in Peoria except in the movie theaters, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. where people are going every Saturday uh, to listen to the Metropolitan. And now, is that part of the problem? When you can go and watch the Met in HD right. on a giant screen, up close, it, it, it's just like the difference, and there is a difference, between going down to Champaign and watching a ball game live mm -hmm. and hearing the excitement versus watching it on your 60-inch HD a TV screen and being able to see the drops of sweat falling off those kids. <laughs> now, you know, they are both valid experiences and they're both great experiences, and lots of fun. Um, every time you go to a live thing, you realize that live is something special mm -hmm. and something yeah. different than TV. But you've got to sell that to these kids and you've got to get them to actually experience it. That's right. And it's the same way with seeing something. It, you, seeing it on television isn't the same as being in the gallery and actually getting close and right. seeing some of the details in the piece of work. But yes, we're not giving our children those experiences and they're not finding other places to get those experiences. I think to reach younger people, there's a couple things you can do. One is programming and the other is programs. Uh, programming, it could be, uh, for example, I think Peter and the Wolf was done not too long ago mm -hmm. by the symphony, and, and that, I'm sure, brought in a lot of young people. Um, for example, this summer, Cornstock has added to their regular lineup of shows. They're going to do Les Mis School Edition. So that's the 18 and under uh, talent is going to be performing the full stage show of Les Mis at Cornstock, which is a great opportunity for young people. Um, at Cornstock, we also created a, a Cornstock for Kids program. So we do children's shows, and we do... Uh, we have a summer, uh, you know, a summer uh, camp program where they come every day for a week and learn the various aspects of, th of theater. So we've tried to come at it from two different points, both the programs and the programming. You mentioned sharing patron lists, and mm -hmm. uh, I wanted to reflect back on a time when there was an effort, Rebecca, to mm -hmm. to create a, a a common location or sharing business of business center. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That didn't fly back then. Might it fly? Now? You know, it might fly just from the standpoint of necessity, as every organization has to look at their resources and figure out where they want to expend them. I think it's going to make more and more sense to have some shared services, maybe even some shared executive talent, uh, some shared purchasing arrangements, shared space, shared equipment, simply because that way one can maximize the resources that one does have. The, the rest of you, do you think that that's a possibility? That Because we always talk about, well, that's a great idea, but the devil's in the detail because now, well, I still want to maintain control over right. Art Guild Right, and, and, and I mean, I think, you know, and we talked about this earlier, I think that it's out of necessity in today's world. I mean, we're, we're all having to look at, mm -hmm. at how do we work, how do we, can we help each other out? Because to me, the stronger the theater is, that just helps the visual arts. Right. I mean, the stronger the arts community is as a whole. I don't, I'm not sure that we care where you're spending your dollars or you're spending your time, mm -hmm. as long as you're helping support an organization. 
So in going back to the shared resources idea, I mean, I know from, the, from um, a lot of the organizations that I'm familiar with, the marketing aspect is one that's always, it's done by a volunteer, it's done by a board member. Um, you know, so the marketing part is getting the message out. Mm -hmm. We struggle getting the message out. Mm -hmm. and, the, and I'm sure you've had this with the Cornstock experience right. and the symphony when somebody comes and goes, oh my gosh, I didn't know. And you go, wait a minute. Mm -hmm. We thought we told everybody, <laughs> and 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 we we see it all the time. Yeah, so we do too. We need if if there was a cooperative marketing mm -hmm. effort to go out there to keep our word getting out all the time. Even if it's something as simple as which we've done in certain cases at Cornstock, is come and set up a table on the patio. Right. As people are arriving for the show to talk to them about what's yeah. happening at the Art Guild or talk to them right. about what's happening at the symphony. I think mm -hmm. you know the Cornstock board would be more than uh, receptive right. to those kind of ideas. Carl? Well, there's got to be, there's got to be a way um, to share resources. And I think the fact that um, some of the fiefdoms have disappeared because the people don't exist and those jobs don't exist mm -hmm. um, may provide some openings and some opportunities because now you really, even though you step in and you try to share things, uh, there's a need for some of those jobs if these organizations are really going to do the outreach. Uh, but I agree, marketing is the thing more than anything that uh, I feel like people just don't get the word on. In all these organizations, right. big and small, I, I'm involved in the Heritage Ensemble in Sharon Reed's uh, choral group. I like to think that everybody knows all about the ensemble and how wonderful they are, and yet I know that the right. vast majority of the people who watch this show and the people in this mm -hmm. community have no idea. And, and that's one yeah. of many organizations that uh, just aren't able to get the word out because they don't have the resources and they don't have the talent to make that happen. Well, then let me bring up Arts Partners. Was that part of Arts Partners' original goal? Yes, when we originally, the task force that met for almost two years, really, to put the infrastructure of Arts Partners together, that was the basis of that infrastructure. It was a business center for the arts, mm -hmm that would have some that shared service and shared purchasing capability so that the organizations could focus on their mission. And that was the reason that Arts Partners was set up as a fund, funding source part of the RTAX, so that Arts Partners would never be out there raising money that might otherwise be given to the Art Guild or the Heritage Ensemble or mm -hmm. Symphony or Cornstock or some other place. Because we felt that if, if the Arts Partners organization had some solid funding sources that would let it operate as a business, then it would always be there as a support for the arts organizations, a platform, if you will. Wasn't that, wasn't, if I remember correctly, all the arts organizations had a board? space or many of them had a board? No, actually we designed it so that the business community would staff that okay. board on purpose. Okay. Again, so that each of the arts organizations could staff their boards with the mission driven folks mm -hmm. like you and me right. that really are, you know, want to focus on the, the particular area of the arts and culture that are that touch our hearts. And we wanted to have the business leadership okay. be the arts partners board so that they would constantly be bringing new and non-traditional resources to the table to help support the arts. Well, it seems to me Arts Partners has veered off of that path and maybe they should come back onto that path? I think it's a resource that's sorely needed from, from its, what its original mission was. Yes, I mean, I think the original mission is what we need today. Mm -hmm. it, uh, is, is that going to be beneficial for arts groups? I, I don't think, in my memory, I don't believe that we've uh, provided any information to Arch Partners on where our major purchasing you know, categories are or those types of issues which may be helpful ultimately to Arch part, Partners to say, well, what does it look like in total? Where, where, is, where is this purchasing happening and what is the total block? Uh, it might be, uh, I think, helpful to put some of that data together so I think we, we did, know how we much we can We gathered it at one time and we did the economic impact mm -hmm. study because we wanted the arts positioned as an economic driver and worthy of support as an economic driver. Because it does get people out of the house mm -hmm. and babysitters and parking yeah. and you know right. all the things that happen Absolutely. when people are in, engaged in activity. Well, I think it's accepted a role more of an advocacy organization and it's done a great job with that. Somebody want to look at the future of the performing and visual arts in central Illinois for 30 seconds? It's going to look different than it does today. 
I think some I think some of the older organizations are going to have a different model five years from now, maybe mm -hmm. even three years from now, and it doesn't mean that it's worse. I, I think, think season tickets are on their way out. I really do. I think buying packages of tickets. I think we're going to have to learn how to make tickets available right here, right now, when the person decides they want to go, and we're going to have to stop the whole, uh, not marketing them, but, mm -hmm. but that structure of getting people to come. Carl, I think real quickly. We've got to attract people that live on the web because everyone under 30 lives on the web. Yep. Thank you to Bob Parkhurst, to Rebecca Borland, to Kim Armstrong, to Carl Coupler for a stimulating conversation and I hope that you continue the conversation at home and, and actually participate in some capacity in the arts community in Central mm -hmm. Illinois. Thank you for joining us on that issue. Next week we'll be back with a discussion uh, with the mayor of Peoria, the mayor of Normal, and the executive director and deputy director of the Illinois Municipal League. Join us next time on At Issue.